Here are eight tactics that are really easy to implement that could make all of your landings way better. The first super important thing to know is that if we want to get better at landing, we need to get better at energy management. In other words, if you can learn to feel and control how much energy or buoyancy, so to speak, that the airplane has, really, you can land any plane. So here are eight tactics to work on your energy management, and they're grouped by in-flight practice, approach, the actual landing itself, and then there's one wildcard tip that's kind of weird, but I think it could help a lot, and I'll share that at the end. First, in our in-flight practice section, I really like to practice slow flight from time to time. Now, many of us just learn it during private or commercial or whatever, and we don't really go back to it, but this is a super, super helpful exercise in energy management. Especially if I haven't flown in a few weeks, maybe because of bad weather or maintenance or both sometimes, which kind of sucks. Uh, I really like going out and starting my flight at 60 knots. Go fly nice and slow and try to get accustomed to slow flight again and feeling the energy or the buoyancy of the airplane. There's a really awesome book called Stick and Rudder, if you haven't read it. It's a really old book, but I think it... it practically and poetically describes uh, how to fly an airplane. And one of the things they talk about is energy management and they describe it as feeling how much lift, how much energy, how much buoyancy does the airplane seem to have. You can kind of feel it in your seat when you're flying slow. When you're flying at cruise, you don't really get a good sense. You have so much extra energy the airplane can work with. You don't really have a great sense of how much it has until you're kind of on the edge. And slow flight really helps you better understand that and, and get a good handle on it. Next, kind of similar to slow flight is that I like to fly down part of the runway in ground effect or close to it. Because that moment between like 100 feet off the ground and touching down, there's really only a few critical seconds there and you're only getting a few seconds of practice of that energy management near the ground. So sometimes I find it helpful to fly a full approach, but then right before touchdown, add just a little bit of power. Don't go full power. You're just adding enough power to maintain a safe uh, airspeed and you're staying in ground effect. You're practicing that energy management close to the ground. And then either you can land you know, farther down the runway, make sure you have enough room, or you can execute a go around. And the reason I think this is so helpful is because normally when you're doing slow flight, you're thousands of feet in the air and you're focused on plus or minus 50 feet, plus or minus 100 feet feet, but if you're doing this down most of the length of the runway, you don't have plus or minus 50 feet to work with. You're plus or minus five feet or something. So your tolerances become much smaller, but you're forced to put your, your eyes outside of the airplane, and then you're forced to use the throttle to manage your energy and, and uh, make sure you're not losing altitude or gaining too much altitude. So it's super helpful. But then the other reason I, I really like it is that it gives you some extra seconds of repetition of flying near the ground, but intentionally not touching the ground. Because normally when you land, you you go from like 100 feet down to touchdown, that 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 moment of like zero to 20 feet only lasts a hair of a second. And so this gives you, you know, gives you more time practicing what that environment is going to feel like. And it's not just a, it's not just a, a moment of transition. We're like, oh, it's 100 feet, now I'm on the ground. No, you get to, you get to kind of practice that in between. I find it really helpful. Next is the stuff you can do on the approach to help with your landing. The first thing here is to use trim for airspeed and use throttle for altitude. I've heard some people describe it the other way around and they swear that it works for them, but I've just never found that to work for me. In my experience, if you can get the airplane trimmed into the right airspeed, then the approach becomes really easy because you're just making some really small adjustments in your power to control the descent rate. And using the trim to fine tune your airspeed is really helpful because you can get really specific with it. You're not using the entire yoke and, and chasing the attitude, chasing the pitch to try to really hone in on an airspeed. If you can pitch it and literally take your hands off the yoke for a second and the airplane holds that altitude, then yeah, you can trim it in from, or, or really fine tune it from 62 knots to 60 knots and be precise. So I really, really love using an excessive amount of trim on the approach. My favorite instructor always used to tell me, are you high, low, fast, or slow? And most importantly, what are you going to do about it? So I use pitch for airspeed and power for altitude. Next, with that in mind, most of us are flying our approaches entirely too fast. Let's just be honest. And in really efficient wings, like on the Cessnas, like a Cessna 172, 182, that sort of thing, any extra airspeed you're carrying in is just gonna cause you to float unnecessarily down the runway. In my 182, I've found that 60 knots or about 70 miles per hour is a perfect approach speed. If it's really, really gusty, I'll add a little bit to that, but generally speaking, 60 knots is the number. The thing that can be tempting is landing on really long runways. You're like, okay, well, 60 knots, okay, I'm at 64 and I'm close enough. 
it's easy to get lazy and say, well, 64 is close enough to, to 60, but what happens when you go to the back country and 60 knots needs to be 60 knots? You can get really lazy, and I'm, I say you, it's really me I'm talking to. I can get really lazy of saying, well, yeah, I'll, I'll fly close to 60 knots, and then when it really counts and you need to be 60 knots, you don't have as much practice really, really nailing that number. And so it's kind of like, you know, back in football, for me, like if, if I practiced really lazily that week, I would play really, and I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't, pra I didn't play a lot of football. I practiced a lot of football, <laughs> but I noticed like coaches were always yelling at us. Like you need to be playing at game speed because what's going to happen when it comes to the game, you're going to play like you practice. And so I, I try to be disciplined and I'm, nobody's perfect, but if, if the, if the approach needs to be 60 knots, make it 60 knots. Next on the approach is to practice spot landings. Now this might sound obvious, but it makes a huge difference to practice spot landings. Cause I think many of us landing on 5,000 foot or 7,000 foot runways, we can kind of land whenever, wherever, and it's fine. It's easy to get lazy. Hey, just put it down somewhere in the first, you know, thousand feet or so, and it doesn't make a difference. But it flexes an entirely new muscle to instead say, I want that specific spot to be my touchdown point. Not only that, I want to manage my energy in such a way that the airplane has no remaining energy to fly right at that touchdown point. Now, sounds great. I will be the, the first to raise my hand and say, this is a lot harder than it sounds sometimes. A quick story on this, a while back I got to fly with Tac Aero flying in their top cub and the mission was to go through some backcountry training and then ultimately land on a river sandbar. It was an awesome day of flying and I was able to make some decent landings but then once they said, all right, now let's practice spot landings. Here's your spot. Hit this spot and don't be fast or don't float past it. And then I got really humbled. A little float past it. I kept floating past the spot and you learn that your aiming point needs to actually be before your touchdown point. That might sound obvious to everyone listening, no duh. But when things are happening really fast, it's easy to get it wrong because you're just aiming for like a general point on the runway instead of a specific landing spot. Now, as the day went on, I got a little bit better with this and ultimately we were able to land on the sandbar and it was one of the coolest aviation training experiences I've ever had. So I'll put a link down in the description if you wanna go watch the full video. Nice. It was an absolute blast. I got to document the whole thing and I learned a lot about landings that day. So the takeaway here is to practice your landings by picking an exact touchdown spot that you're trying to nail. Now, we don't always have a massive green dot painted on the runway like they do at Oshkosh to use as our target, but the 1000 foot markers are really helpful instead. And, and they're also helpful because you aren't needing to touch down like right at the start of the runway, but you also have lots of runway left too. So try to hit the start of those 1000 foot markers right as the stall warning is going off. It's really great practice. Now on the actual landing, here are some things to implement. First is to not get spoiled landing on long runways. I'm based at a 7,000 foot runway. Most of us are landing on, on runways that long and it's easy to get sloppy because there's no consequence for being sloppy. And so wherever possible, I really try to treat long runways like they're short runways. Next is to treat landing as a flight maneuver. There's a lot happening right before touchdown. And so I think it's easy to sometimes get in the mindset of, well, we'll just, we'll cross over the numbers, we'll chop the power and we'll just kind of hold it off and let it settle on the runway. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to do, but I do think it can lead us into a little bit more of a passive mindset. We're a little bit more of a passenger in that point. It's something that's just kind of happening around us instead of something that we're intentionally causing the airplane to do. But I noticed a really big shift in my landings when I, when I kind of changed my mentality from landing just being something that kind of happened and you try to just let it settle on the ground to instead being an intentional flight maneuver. So just like slow flight or stalls or steep turns are all intentional flight maneuvers, landings can be exactly the same. So what that means is intentionally putting the airplane's wheels softly on the ground where you want on the runway, at the airspeed you want, and at the descent rate you want so you don't bounce. Now it's hard to get all of those things right at the same time in unison, but that's also what makes it really rewarding. Now, practically speaking, I find that I make the best landings whenever I'm slow enough, if I'm going too fast, this won't work, but I'm slow enough to where as I come in, um, I can flare using the existing energy that the airplane has. I'm not touching the throttle yet. You're just using the energy to arrest the sync rate and then going, I'm pulling out the throttle here on my Cessna, just bear with me. Um, and then, then I go idle on the throttle to then let the airplane touch down. If you notice on airliners, and maybe it's not like this every time, but I've really noticed that, that this seems to be how they do it, where they'll come in and then you notice the flare, you notice the change in energy, and then you can hear the engines go to idle. Seems how they do it, and I tend to make much better landings when I do it this way. Now, you might have to reduce the throttle before you get to the flare, depending on your speed. It really just comes down to energy management. But the point is this, 
I think you'll find the right technique to use in the moment when you just tell yourself this, I'm intentionally flying this airplane all the way to the ground. I'm not just giving up on it and ground effect and hoping we land smoothly. And with all of this talk about energy management, here is my wild card tip. This might sound weird, but try watching the birds in your backyard or your park sometime. Just go with me here. I mean, they log more flight time, so to speak, than we ever will, and they're masters at managing their energy. Try to take notice how they can go from full speed to turning and slowing down and perfectly landing on a branch with no residual forward motion. I mean, I love watching seagulls land on docks and things or birds land on a power line. I mean, they fly better approaches than I ever will. And it's because they understand how to manage their energy and flying a plane really is the same thing. Eventually, we're not just learning how to control an airplane, but we're learning what it means to fly. And those are two really different things. The best lessons I've learned in landing came from flying with TAC Aero, like I mentioned earlier. Now it's probably the biggest and most challenging video I've ever made from a production standpoint, and I'm really proud of it, but I think you'll enjoy it and learn something from it too. That video is on the screen right now, and so I'll see you there.